1 Thessalonians is about faith, love, and hope as gifts that God gives to each one of us. God who calls us to faith is the one who enables human love and is the source of our hope. And 1 Thessalonians has something to say to people who are struggling with faith, who are striving to love their family and others, even when it's not easy to do so, or even when it's having to say goodbye to someone that we love. And it also has something to say about hope for those who are struggling or wavering to believe. So listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you receive the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we, we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. This is God's word for us for today. There are mental and emotional health challenges that come with living in a time of crisis. We all have fewer emotional reserves than we usually do when we're living through a time of stress, and we need to do what we can to refill those reserves and live in a way that honors God, helps others, and enables us to be resilient and hopeful. I read an article this past week in the Boston Globe that noted that the coronavirus pandemic is affecting nearly every country across the globe. And while it's unknown how many will be affected physically, practically everyone will be affected emotionally. There will be prolonged isolation for some, overcrowded homes for others, and sustained levels of heightened stress and anxiety, as well as financial hardships, strained relationships, grief, and loss. But what does our faith have to say to a time such as this? Well, here's the key thought I want to share with you today. The anxiety, loneliness, and grief that so many are feeling and experiencing are countered by faith, love, and hope. The antidote to anxiety is faith. The antidote to loneliness is love. The antidote to grief is hope. So let's walk through these verses in 1 Thessalonians together and see how God might use them to encourage us. First of all, I want you to note how the letter begins. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. If I were to ask you, what's their first impression you have of the Apostle Paul? I think there are at least a few of us who Picture Paul as kind of this solo person who's going around and doing all this work and writing all these letters, but Paul's not a soloist. Paul always operates as part of a team, and that's made evident right in the beginning of this letter. It's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy who are writing the letter and working together. 
And it reminds me of that verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12, where it says that though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. It's vitally important for us to remember what we gain from being connected together. And I want to say, especially to those of you who may be living alone, uh, it's really important for you to pick up the phone and just call three to five people every day so you have some human interaction and connection. If it's a nice day, take a chair and go sit in your front yard and say hi to neighbors who may be walking by or working in their yard. We all need human connection. And Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are part of a team sharing and working together, and that's part of what makes them strong and effective. I also want to note the words that follow because they don't say greetings. They say grace and peace. And that is telling us right at the beginning of this letter that the relationship, the friendship between Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy and the Thessalonians is not just an ordinary friendship. It's a friendship and a relationship and a bond that has been forged and created by God, who is the giver of both grace and peace. And then Paul goes on to describe how they are constantly mentioning and remembering the Thessalonians before God in prayer, and for three significant things especially. The first is for their work of faith. That also could be translated work that stems from faith or work that belongs to faith. Now, in one sense, our faith in God is a gift given to us by God. When we do a spiritual gift class, faith is a gift that some people have in a higher proportion than just ordinary or typical believers. So faith, on the one hand, is a gift, but it's also something we have to work at. Paul will write later in the second chapter of Philippians in verses 12 and 13, he writes to that whole church that they need to work out, and that word is plural, it's the whole community, they need to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. We have to work out what God has first worked in us. Well, how do we do that? Well, two of the main ways we work at our faith, we grow our faith, are through reading God's word, and praying. And that's part of why we started having these daily Bible reading schedules each month to encourage people to go deeper in the Word, as well as having a daily verse of the day that you could just focus on that one verse. And we've been having these video reflections on those verses as well. We want to help you grow your faith by going deeper into the Word. And some of you I know are listening. You can listen to God's Word on your phone as you go for walks, which is a great way to do two good things at once. But faith is like a muscle. The more we exercise it regularly, the stronger it will become. Tough times also reveal whether we're truly putting our faith and trust in God or not. And whether that's a tough time like we're living through now or a time that we read about in the Gospels, for example, and the story in Mark chapter 4 and verses 35 to 41 where Jesus and the disciples are in the boat and Jesus is taking a nap and there's a windstorm and the waves and the disciples are all terrified and they wake Jesus up saying, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus calms the wind and the waves and he says to them, What? He says, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Our faith grows and deepens in faith-testing times. And those are the times we're living in right now. A second part of the work of faith is prayer. As we pour out our needs, our hopes, our dreams, our intercessions, our frustrations, our questions to God in prayer, that also helps to strengthen our faith regularly worshiping God, even when we can't physically be together, is a third way that we can strengthen our faith. So our work of faith may not change our outward circumstances, but it will strengthen and equip us to face those outward circumstances with greater resilience 
and greater perseverance. The second thing that Paul mentions after their work of faith is their labor of love. Uh, have you ever heard that phrase used? Uh, it's a labor of love. Uh, some people will talk about even a hobby like gardening, for example, as a labor of love. It takes time and effort, but it produces something that looks good. Other people will use that phrase, labor of love, to refer to things that, well, they just kind of have to be done as part of life. And so, for example, doing the laundry, well, it's a labor of love. Or making dinner for the whole family, well, it's a labor of love. And a labor of love is something that often is challenging or difficult, but it benefits not just ourselves. It often benefits more directly other people. And we're going to hear about love repeatedly in 1 Thessalonians, so it's going to be a major theme for these next nine weeks. Now, right now, some of us are living in small pods with a few other people. Some of us are living with one person, others with a little larger family. Others are home alone. But for those of us who are living with others, our labor of love may take many forms. It might be making meals or doing laundry or taking care of the yard or the recycling or walking the dog or cleaning the dishes. The list goes on and on of labors of love that we can do for others in our household. And just as Paul referred to the work of faith, because faith is not always easy and it doesn't grow without effort, you notice he also doesn't write of the bliss of love or the rapture of love. No, it's the labor of love. Because love, especially agape Christian love that seeks the good of the other and seeks to serve others, that's not always easy. It takes effort. It may involve sharing and giving of our resources with those who have less than we do. It may mean taking time to make phone calls, to connect with people. It may mean taking time to text with people, to email with people. Love is time-consuming. As a song by the group Orleans uh, sang many years ago, love takes time, yours and mine. And there's no getting around that. It is a labor of love. One of my baseball movies that I like is A League of Their Own, and there's a great scene where Tom Hanks is saying to Gina Davis, and she's trying to decide whether she's going to play or leave the team, and she says, it's, it's, just, it's just too hard. And Tom Hanks says, it's supposed to be hard. It's the hard that makes it great. Well, that can also be true of the labor of love. Our work of faith our labor of love. The third thing that Paul and his team writes about is their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Richard Rohr, who is a spiritual writer and a Franciscan friar who's based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, he sends out a, a daily devotional that a number of people in the church I know receive. And he wrote this week about hope. He said, the virtue of hope with great irony is the fruit of a learned capacity to suffer wisely, calmly, and generously. The ego demands successes to survive. The soul needs only meaning to thrive. Somehow hope provides its own kind of meaning in a most mysterious way. Well, Paul, in writing about the steadfastness of hope, he's referring to a particular kind of hope in chapter 1, and that's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and hope specifically in his return in what we would call today his second coming. And this is going to be a significant theme also in 1 Thessalonians that I'm not going to say too much about today because it'll be a total focus for a later sermon in this series. But part of what having a steadfast hope in the Lord Jesus and in his return does is it gives us a solid foundation in the very shifting sands and in the uncertainty of life. And that steadfast hope is like a bedrock 
that we can build on. Paul goes on in these verses to commend the Thessalonians for several things that we also can think about in our own lives besides faith, love, and hope. He touches on reminding them that they are beloved and chosen by God. And I know that there are some of you watching and listening to this sermon that that may be the most important phrase in this scripture for you to hear and to know. Because there are many of us who didn't necessarily receive the kind of love that a child or a person should get growing up. And it's really important to know, no matter who you are and where you are or how old you are, that you are beloved by God and you are chosen by God and God wants you to be a part of God's church and God's family. And that's an important phrase that I think Paul uses as he is beginning this letter. He also commends them because the word or the message of the gospel that was shared with them uh, didn't come to them in word only. In other words, it didn't go in one ear and out the other and not change them in any way. And he, he says that the word of the gospel came to them in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction that it was a transforming word that they receive. And part of what we need to do when we listen to the scriptures, when we listen to sermons or read the Bible, we want to be open to the word coming at us in the Holy Spirit and in power and with full conviction in a way that we are open to receiving and being changed and transformed by it. Because the church uh, became imitators of Paul and of the Lord, that's another thing they are commended for. Now, sometimes when we hear the word imitation, uh, one of the things we think of is something that's fake. We say, oh, well, that's an imitation such and such. It's not real. It's not genuine. Well, in spiritual terms, it's actually a very ancient practice that we want to be imitators of our spiritual leader, our spiritual guide. And so Paul is commending the church that not only did they receive the word, not only is the Holy Spirit present with them, but then they began this journey of imitating the faith of Paul and Silvanus who were ahead of them and of imitating the life of Jesus. And that's what we are all called to do. We are all called to be little imitation Jesuses in our lives and in our families and in the world in which we live. And another thing that Paul commends them for is that in spite of persecution, they receive the word with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, joy is going to be something that Paul connects with the Christian life over and over again. And it's joy not because everything externally is wonderful. It's joy in the Holy Spirit and in God that the world can't touch or take away. And so he commends the church for receiving this word, this word about Christ and about faith and love and hope. They not only receive it, but they immediately begin to share it with others as well. And they become an, an, an example to other people in the entire Greek mainland. So in a sense, the evangelized become the evangelists. You know, one of the good things about the days in which we're living is that so many of you are able to and are sharing with your family and friends, for example, links to sermons like this one or worship services like we have. People are sharing our daily Bible verse reflections. And that's one of the ways we can follow the example of the Thessalonians. We can share what God has given to us with other people. And it's fascinating to me. I'm, I'm hearing from people in Florida, in Texas, in Colorado, in Pennsylvania, in New Hampshire, Tennessee, and so many other places because so many of you are sharing our worship, our sermons, our messages with them. So thank you for doing that, and I encourage you to keep on doing it. So they are commended for their faith, their love, their hope, for how they have received and shared the word, for becoming imitators of Christ. And then finally, 
Paul and Silvanus and Timothy have one final piece to share with them. As Paul brings the first chapter of Thessalonians to a close, he uses a few key words, turn, serve, and wait. And he says specifically, he commends the Thessalonians for turning from idols. And that phrase in verse 9 is a clue that most of the people in the church were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. They were people who turned from worshiping idols to worshiping other things. And there were many different uh, types of worship in the city of Thessalonica. People worshiped the Roman imperial cult. There were Phrygian deities, Egyptian deities. People worshiped all kinds of things. And so the church in Thessalonica was made of people who turned from things that are not ultimate. And we want to make sure that our worship is of God, uh, who is the creator of all things. And remember in the Ten Commandments that we are to have no other gods before God, and we're also not to make an idol or any graven image. So Paul's commending them. They have turned from idols. They have converted from them to serve a living and a true God. And this is the language of conversion. When we become a Christian, we need to turn away from, give up any allegiance that would replace God and Jesus Christ at the top of our list. And then finally, he says, because they are waiting waiting for Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Now, it's important to understand that wrath or judgment of God, it's not irrational anger or, and, and that sort of thing. It refers to God's righteous response to humanity's persistent disobedience. That's what the wrath that is to come is. God's righteous response to humans' persistent disobedience. And to wait for Jesus, to wait in biblical terms, it is first of all to expect. We expect something to come, and so we wait with hope for it. To wait is also to, to acknowledge that there are things that are beyond our control. And that's, I think, very helpful to always remember. What is within my control? What is beyond my control? And finally, waiting for God, we learn as we read through the New Testament as a whole, is really a primary attribute of the Christian life. And it's also in the Hebrew Bible as well. We read about it in the Psalms repeatedly and in the prophet Isaiah. But in the Christian life, there's this pattern and the pattern of transformation is suffering that is transformed, not suffering avoided. It's death that is transformed, not death that is avoided. And that's always a disappointment to many people because we want one without the other. We'd like transformation without change, without cost, without expectation or demands or surrender. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is going to be encouraging us to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've never made a faith decision about putting your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, as the one you're hoping in now and always, I encourage you to invite Christ into your heart by faith, believing that he teaches the way we are to live in this world as daughters and sons of God, that through his death on the cross, we all receive the forgiveness of our sins. Through his resurrection, we have the hope of eternal, abundant, joyful life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you've never taken that step of trusting Christ in that way, I encourage you to do so. And I'd love to hear from you if you do, or if you'd like to talk more about how to do that. I also want to encourage you as I draw this message to a close to think about at least one way this coming week that you can either strengthen and share your faith. How can you work on, strengthen, or share your faith in the coming week? For one person, it might mean, you know, I'm going to start reading the Bible. I maybe never have done that as an adult. For another person, it might mean I'm going to take a step in prayer and I'm going to join the Wednesday evening 
prayer time that we have from 7 to 7.30 this coming week. For another person, it might be thinking about what labor of love can I do to make life a little easier for somebody else? For someone else, it might be a decision to share with family members and friends our services or messages or our devotions that when you think they might be a blessing for them. Some of us may have been worshiping or serving idols and not even recognized it. We may be like fish swimming in a polluted pond who don't even realize that the things we're spending time with, that we're watching or reading or listening to or praising, are actually poisoning us. And like the Thessalonians, we may need to turn from those idols to serve a living God. Some of us may need to reorient our life. You know, one of the saddest aspects of living in these days are just the thousands of deaths that are taking place. This past week, the Sunday Boston Globe had 16 pages of obituaries and death notices. And in an obituary, a family often will include things about the person who died, and usually it's things related to how the person may want to be remembered. I don't know if you've already written your own obituary or not. Some people would tell you that's actually a good exercise to do because it's a way of asking myself, how do I want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? Well, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy remember the church of the Thessalonians for their wonderful work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great way to be remembered? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you were remembered that way? And if I were to, please join me as I pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you that it still speaks to us across the years and across cultures. And we pray, God, that there would be something that we shared today that would be a blessing and a help to all who hear it. God, help us to grow as disciples of Christ, we pray and to share the good news that we have welcomed and received. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.